Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am Frank Benson Jones and I welcome you to this session of Bible study. I encourage you to subscribe to this channel so you can get a notice whenever new lessons are added. And please give a thumbs up to the individual Bible studies that you enjoy. We are continuing in the Sermon on the Mount and today we're going to start at Matthew chapter 5 verse 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old times, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's a reference to the Ten Commandments where we were told, thou shalt not commit adultery. Matthew 5 and 28, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. That means that we have to be careful about our thoughts. We have to be careful about what we think because we see in Psalm 51 and 10, King David's prayer after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, uh, he let his thoughts get the best of him. One evening, David was walking on his roof and he saw a, a woman across from his roof bathing and he saw that she was very beautiful. And David inquired about who she was and re received an answer that she was the wife of Uriah. And David sent a message to her and told her to come to his house. And David committed adultery with Bathsheba. We have to, con have to watch our thoughts. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. King David allowed his lust to get the best of him. As the Bible says in 1 John 2 and 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. James 1 and 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. We have to be careful of lusting after somebody. That is, that is thinking about them uh, within the case of adultery and desiring to have them uh, and letting that lust uh, take control of our lives. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. James 1 and 15, but when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. We don't want that. We want to control our thoughts. We don't want to have a lust for mind, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, because those things are of the world and of the devil. We want to have a clean heart and, and live the way that God would have us to live. And if any part of our body causes us to lust, we read Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 and 30. And if thy right eye offend thee, that is, causes thee to sin, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. This is telling us that we have to control our flesh, uh, our eyes where we see things that we want, our right hand where we might use it to steal something. If any part of our body is sinful, it can lead the whole body into sin, and we have to be on guard against that. Romans chapter 8 verse 13 tells us what we must do. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit, use the Spirit, do mortify or kill the deeds of the body, ye shall live. We want to live. We want to be sure that we don't let our fleshly desires overtake us to the point that we sin and offend God by what we do. We read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, For all that is in the world, I've mentioned this before, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the, of the Father, but is of the world. We have to mortify the flesh. We have to control our eyes and our thoughts. We want to live godly lives and we want to have godly thoughts. Don't let the lust of the flesh, any desire that we have in our flesh, maybe to commit adultery or fornication, the lust of the eyes, looking at things and desiring them, 
the pride of life, wanting more than other people, and wanting to have certain kind of automobile or clothes or homes. We don't want to let any of this detract us from serving God. We go on to Matthew chapter 5, verse 31. It has been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Now, this is what Moses had taught the people that, that uh, he could, a per man could give his wife a bill of divorcement and go and marry someone else. But Jesus says in Matthew 5 and 32, But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving or except for the cause of fornication, that fornication could be sexual immorality, it should be, causes her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. Now what this is saying is that unless the wife is found, or wife or husband, is found to be involved in sexual immorality, not just fornication, it could be adultery, it could be homosexuality, it could be childhood molestation, or any number of sexual sins, should not put away their husband or wife. And he calls her, if he puts her away, because the husband is innocent, causes her to commit adultery, or him to commit adultery, and whosoever, whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committed adultery. We should not marry a, a divorced person unless we know the reason for that divorce. And when I say we must know the reason for that divorce, I'll explain that on, on another slide in just a moment. But let's go to Mark chapter 10, verse 6. Uh, Jesus is answering those people who mention what Moses had allowed them to do by giving his wife or her, his wife a writ of divorcement. Mark chapter 10, verse 6. But from the, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain, that is, they too, shall be one, one flesh. So then they are no more two or twain, but one flesh. Where, what therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. That Moses did what he did because of the hardness of people's heart. But Jesus Christ is saying different, and we obey Jesus in this dispensation. We should not put away our mate unless we have a valid cause. I'll discuss those in the next, few, next three slides. Remarriage, that is, a person who has been married. Remarriage is permitted in the event of a death of a spouse. That, that's almost self-explanatory. If your spouse dies, then you do have a right to remarry. There's no scripture that tells you that you cannot. Now, the second circumstance under which a Christian can remarry after divorce would be if they divorce their husband or wife because of sexual immorality just what it said in matthew chapter 5 verse 32 but i say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife or husband saving or except for the cause of fornication that is pornonia uh, sexual immorality the same the greek word is a root word for pornography uh, sexual immorality causes her or him to commit adultery and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committed adultery. But here's what I'm concentrating on. You may remarry if you've been married and got a divorce because of disloyalty by your spouse. And the third circumstance in which uh, remarriage is permitted is if your spouse deserts you. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 15. But if the unbelieving departs, that is the unbelieving spouse, let him or her depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Now you notice it says unbeliever. What if your spouse is professing Christianity? Then if they're professing Christianity, they're really not practicing it and they are an unbeliever if they depart from you after they're married to you. Hold on to all of the things that Jesus Christ has taught us. Everything that he teaches in the uh, Sermon on the Mount is practical for us as for us to practice today and do the things that makes God happy and pleased with the way we live. I pray that God will bless and keep you 
In Jesus' name, amen.